Jacob, uh, you don't know who I am. Um, my name is Al Campbell, uh, but I know a lot about you because I watched you on television um, on NBC. And, um, and the reason for this video um, is because I want you to uh, consider uh, returning with me to Myanmar, what used to be called Burma just over a year from now, uh, during winter break. I'm 75 years old. I'm uh, still teaching a couple classes uh, in college, and um, I plan to go back to Myanmar for the third time in just over a year. Um, And let me, let me, there, there, there are a couple things that you need to know about me. Um, one is I've done the Dance with Death twice. It was, it was exactly 10 years ago that um, I fell off of a uh, ladder and cracked my head on a retaining wall and was in intensive care for about a month and then spent an, almost another month in a rehab hospital. And when the uh, surgeon operated on me, um, the first time I was in the hospital, uh, he told my family that I had a 50-50 chance of making it through the surgery. He wasn't <laughs> going to indicate if I made it through what I'd be like so what he did was come in and open my uh, skin, pulled it back, and took a saber saw and took the skull out, took the skin, pulled it back, and stitched it back. And I was that way for about over eight, nine weeks. By that time, my head had, my brain had swelled out and then receded, came back about Two and a half months after the fall, he opened my head open, put <laughs> the skull back in, sewed it up, and and except for hearing, uh, I don't hear very well, so he used two hearing aids, but then that solved the problem. And the same year, just a couple months earlier than that, I went to the University of Chicago because I had prostate cancer and they robotically took out the prostate as an outpatient. I wasn't there for 24 hours. But the surgeon, um, <laughs> the surgeon said, you know, we did a good job on the, getting your prostate out, but the cancer had metastasized and you're gonna have to come back every six months to get a P PSA reading and it was just a matter of time. And within a year and a half or two years, it, it spiked again. And so I went back for uh, two weeks or two weeks, two months of hormone therapy, and then continued that hormone therapy for another two months. And during that second half of those two months, um, I took radiation for a whole month or a whole two months of um, radiation every day at the University of Chicago. And um, I've been cancer free for almost eight years. Um, and the, the issue, the reason for telling you those stories about my near, <laughs> near death experiences is that um, that the people who have done the dance with death perceive life differently and it changes them. I mean, I would not want to go through either one of those procedures ever again, but I wouldn't delete them from my life because it changed me. Everybody, and I mean, you have to be five years old or older, and you'll know 
that you're you're not immortal that someday that you're going to die i mean you know you're going to die dance with death and you know it at a higher reality And once I realized that I had done the dance, once I realized it, it changed who I am. And I, you know, I, you know, I live and enjoy the moment. And I know that my clock is ticking and I want to leave a mark in this world. I went to college, then grad school, and then in the late 60s, just after Bobby Kennedy was assassinated, I uh, went overseas to, uh, to Scotland, to the University of Edinburgh at New College, and was there for a year. And the summer before and the summer after that year, I uh, traveled all over Western Europe, um, part of North Africa. And, and that was 50 years ago, and in those 50 years of lapsed, I have been all over the world. I've taught overseas, gone to school overseas, been a tour guide overseas, had tour guides overseas, and done it on my own. I mean, I've been to probably four dozen countries. Some of the countries don't even exist anymore. Yugoslavia, Czechoslovakia, East Germany. Um, and of all the places that I have ever been that have radically changed who I am is a country called Myanmar. It used to be called Burma. And it was almost, almost exactly five years ago that I was there the first time. And I, 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 a year before I went, I had written to everybody about trying to get contact with um, Dallas Sushi Sushi because I wanted an interviewer for my webpage, for my classes I teach. I mean, <laughs> and I was another failure. Uh, but when I was there, uh, two things happened. One is that I was able to interview Min Konan, and he's on my webpage. Min Konan was um, one of the 8 8 generation um, protest group. Um, and I, I saw him as Bobby Kennedy. And I spent a lot of time with him. And the other, I mean, and when I went there the first time, I hired a tour company that that would uh, sublet Americans and give them to local Burmese tour agencies. And the, it was a private situation where you would get a, a car, a driver, and a, a tour guide. And they have you know, told you where most people want to go, where else would you want to go, and it was really open-ended and I had, it was a time of my life. Um, it was the best trip I'd ever made. Uh, and I had four guides and I was there for a month and I had four guides basically for once, one of them per week. And when I was up in, outside of Mandalay, there's an island and a, and a, a lake called Inlay Lake. And the tour guide there was uh, a young woman by the name of Momo. And she was an excellent guide and very concerned and very, um, he was always thinking of the tourist. And I <laughs> was there with her for a month or a week and she, in the middle of the week, she said, um, I'm really sorry, but I have to pick up some papers for you at my home so that you, you know who the tour guide is when you leave Maine, what hotel you're going to be in, all that kind of. 
and she was very apologetic. And I said, no, don't try. And then she had, oh, by the way, my daughter will be home because she's on winter break. And her name is TT. And TT was nine years old. Walked into their house, and there was this beautiful, cute kid who said, Hi, my name is TT. Do you want to play some games? <laughs> so I sat down on the floor, and we played Scrabble for almost an hour. Um, they don't have money for a Scrabble board, so what, they, what she did was get a piece of paper and a pencil, wrote, wrote a word across the top, and gave me a piece of paper and pencil, and I wrote, did it one side, flipped it over, did it the other side, and once we got to the end of the second side, she said, or I said, and she said, the game's over, and I said, TT, I really had a lot of fun. This was really a great experience, and I started to get up, and she said, no, you wait, 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 wait. I had to add up the score. And it took her two seconds, and she added up, and she said, I won, I won. And I stuck my finger in her face and I said, young lady, don't you ever forget this. You beat me in my game, in my language, in your country. Don't you ever forget that. That game of playing Scrabble with Titi, a nine-year-old kid, morphed Titi from being the daughter of my tour guide to my granddaughter. While I was in around Inlay Lake, I met um, Titi's younger sisters who were in a preschool kind of daycare center. And at that time, they were two and four years of age. And I met Coco uh, Momo's husband. I have three adult children, one adult granddaughter, and two grandsons who are in elementary school. When I do finally belly go belly up and die, they're going to be in the will. My will. They're in my will. You know who else is in my will? My family and me more. Dancing with Death changed me in a positive way. But that family changed me. I came back and, and just as happenstance, I had to, I have a high blood pressure. I had high blood pressure. I went to see a cardiologist. He gave me Lazartan several years ago, probably five, six, oh, gee, probably a decade ago. And, um, and, and I take that little white pill and I haven't had any high blood pressure at all. But I happen to have, I, mean, I had to go back every six months to see him, to check me out and to see him fine, get out unless you have any questions. And I had just come back within a week of being in Memoir the first time five years ago. So Dr. Marchand says, oh, so Cam, will you have any questions if not get out? And I said, I do have a question. Why am I so wired? And when he knew that I was serious about my question, he looked at me, paused, made sure that I was watching his eyes. And he said, you have seen the light. And continued to stare at me. I mean, I'm telling you the story. It, it, the whole episode probably took 10 seconds, but it, it, it had a profound effect upon me because now I had to figure out what that meant, that I had seen the light. And if you go to my webpage and click on articles and look on the right-hand side, the first thing at the top of that page on the right-hand side under critical issues is on seeing the light. Four years after my first trip to Myanmar, in other words, just 
almost a year ago, during winter break, I returned to Myanmar to see my family. And if, and if the first trip to Myanmar was a great trip, the second trip, and it, it will only be surpassed by the next time I go, which will be a year from now. Um, and, and this happened just, you know, Around Christmas time last year, I was there and they took me around in the lake again and went to lots of places and had lots of fun with my family. And I, uh, when I travel, I always bring a laptop. I absolutely detest laptops. Laptops are not computers for me. What they are, what laptops are, is a, is a way of storing videos and pictures. A laptop is just simply a hard drive for me. I have two large screen uh, monitors on my desktop. They're not large enough and I want three because I teach online and I work and I have my web page. I need space and uh, even a large laptop is a pain in the neck to me. And on my second trip, the TT now is, uh, she was almost 14 when I was there the second time. And um, I said, you know, to TT, I said, I'm, I'm going to go back to the United States pretty soon. And I'm going to take this laptop and I'm going to put it up on my bookshelf and not touch it until I travel again. Or, I can give it to you. Um, she is on my webpage because she's doing a section about being a travel guide. <laughs> one day, um, one day, I mean, I, and, when, and when I went back there the second time, Coco, her husband, who I had met the first time I was there. Um, but the second time I was there, he was my tour guide, all except for one day, and Momo was. And I, I mean, Momo had told me that she was gonna be my tour guide one day, but Coco wanted to be my tour guide, so I said, fine. And so I got into the car, and Momo was sitting there, but who else was sitting there? Titi. And she, she, uh, she and her mother were my tour guides that day. And I was so impressed by her that I asked her when I came back if, if she would be willing to, whenever she got time from school, to do a video about places that tourists ought to go to. And she did one of Inlay Lake, and it's in my Under Critical Issues. I gave her the laptop. She's now in the process of going over about a thousand photographs that I took while I was there. And um, she's putting captions under them. Uh, and probably in another month or so, they'll all be done. Um, but giving um, TT my laptop uh, was problematic for me. One is that their internet access is miserable. Um, you know, they have Wi-Fi, but I mean, it's it might be slightly better than the old dial-up, um, and so that is a problem. It is really she can do things. If, if, I mean, she has all the photographs, and, and she, we have drop, I have Dropbox, and she has access to my Dropbox, so all she does is 
go to folders and open them in her computer and then tells me they're ready and then I, I don't even have to download them, I just go to my computer and pull them up and they're going to wind up on my webpage pretty soon. But the use of a laptop for an emerging country is, I mean, first off, it's a poor country and most kids throughout their elementary school and high school years, I bet you, I bet you that there are very few that actually own a computer and might have seen a couple computers while they're in school. But if TT and her two younger sisters are my family, so are the kids that they, my three granddaughters, go to school with. And so I got it through my head that um, I want to raise um, a half million dollars. Um, $400,000 for 1,250 laptops for the schools, the two schools that my granddaughters attend. And then with the remainder, I need to pay, there, there are a couple foreign countries that have like Comcast in up in that area. And I'm negotiating with them about the cost to at least get good internet access bandwidth to those two schools. And depending on the, the cost to do that to the entire community, of the, the community is called Tangia. And so, and then, and then the remainder of money would be maintenance of those, um, those sites. So I need half a million dollars. And so I'm in the process, the beginning stages of GoFundMe and um, going after um, uh, people who have big bucks. And if you go to critical issues, on the right hand side you see on seeing light and the next one's on we are family. If you go to the end of that introduction for kind of a mini web page, um, you'll see three requests. I want people to give me money for a laptop. I want people to write to their friends, 12 of their friends or 15 of their friends or 20 of their friends and give them links to this page. But then next winter break, a year and a couple months from now, I want them to come back with me and see where their money is being spent. You know, nationality, ethnic background for me is Scottish. My great, great grandfather came from Scotland, which means you know, really nothing. But the first place I ever visited was Scotland. I've been to Scotland twice, went to school there, for a whole year, we came back a couple of month or a couple of years ago for another month of going through Scotland, and I love Scotland, but it pales in comparison to Myanmar, and and it's not just my family or my extended family, but that country is is dirt poor, except for the military and a couple other people that have money. But they are different, they're, they're different. And so, and, and part of their differences are the things that, are the things that, that help me change and motivate me to help them. I told you earlier in this video, which is going longer than I was expecting, but I know, I mean, I am in perfectly good health. There's, I'm, I'm, there's nothing is going on in my life that is threatening, life threatening to me. So I expect to live 15, 20 more years. But I plan to leave my mark on Myanmar.
and help them emerge into the 21st century. And the only way they're going to do that is access through the computer. That is the only means for them to, the smart ones in their society, to be able to access education. And so that's the reason for the laptops and that's the reason for the internet. And so what I want you to do is to consider returning with me around Christmas of 2019. Um, and I said at the beginning of this video that I've watched you on television, but the single event that most resonated in, in, in my mind about you and me was your attitude about what Trump is doing uh, on the borders Mexico, uh, between Mexico and the United States. The refugee issue impoverished people trying to survive. The people in Myanmar are not much different. They're trying to survive. And I was lucky enough to meet one family that changed who I am. Not, it didn't change me from left to right, from liberal to conservative or whatever. It simply said, you know, back in the 60s, I was gung-ho in the civil rights. And if, if, if I was here in the 60s, I'm here now. It's not that I've gone from one side to the other. It's simply the degree of drive that I have. And the two things that changed me were the two dances with death and meeting TT. And that happened to me. And at least a part of that can be tasted and felt by people who come back with me in a year from now. So I want you to um, consider, I mean, you go to my webpage and you'll be there for years, but there's a commonality of our purpose in life. And I saw it and I want to utilize it by having you come back with me and your crew. You could do, you could talk about what we're trying to do in Tangia with the laptops. You could talk about all the social issues for people in Neymar. They have a slew of them. Um, and maybe, uh, <laughs> I just thought about this, maybe, um, maybe, uh, you and I could sit down with the lady on San Sushi. <laughs> well, I wish I thought of that before I started this video and I started the video with that. But, so, so what I want you to do is to look at, look over my webpage and then talk to your boss and give your boss this video link to my webpage and the link to this request. Trust me. I believe this can happen. Raising half a million dollars and returning and having a good time seeing me more, but maybe we could get to see the lady. That would be a, um, a Pulitzer moment for you. So <laughs> take care, and I, I, I really uh, appreciate your listening to this. I really thought that this would be a lot shorter than it turned out, but I got my message out to you, not in a concise way, but I got it out. And so um, I look forward to hearing from you.